When I was young, the original PlayStation was still the hot console on the market, and Sony and Pizza Hut had this close relationship that spawned the Fable Pizza Hut demo disc. These discs are how I would become exposed to Medieval, Byro the Dragon, Legacy of Kain Soul Reaver, and many other games of the era. A game my father and older brother found particularly interesting was Metal Gear Solid. From the beginning, my father was stunned by the way the guards interacted with things the player did, such as walking through water puddles, leaving footprints in the snow, and knocking on walls. To him, this was revolutionary elements of AI, foretelling the future possibilities of games moving into the next millennium. While there would undoubtedly be fantastic games releasing throughout the rest of 98, 99, and the 2000s, what my father either didn't know or didn't consider was that the genius of Metal Gear Solid was the direct result of its auteur, THE Hideo Kojima. The internet was still a fledgling way of finding out things at the time, so knowing the development history of a game was nigh impossible for the average consumer to discover. A game with Metal Gear Solid's approach to game design wouldn't exist again until Metal Gear Solid 2, Sons of Liberty, and so on and so forth. Kojima is the linchpin that made Metal Gear Solid the impressive piece of art it is. But what of Kojima's earlier work? Was Metal Gear Solid his first good game? Successful creators often to talk about how their earliest works are not that great contemporarily or retrospectively. But what about Kojima himself? Has he ever made a bad game? That's the question I sought to answer with this review. While Kojima had worked on other projects such as Penguin Adventure in 1986, his first auteur work was Metal Gear from 1987. The first game in what would later become known as the Metal Gear Solid franchise with the release of that PlayStation Classic in 1998. In this video, I'll be breaking down Metal Gear, evaluating it on its gameplay, exploration, music, and themes to delineate how Metal Gear proves Kojima has never made a bad game. I can't discuss the game to that level without the freedom to include anything I noticed in my playthrough. As such, this is your big spoiler warning for the rest of the video. Click away now if you don't want major aspects of the game's design spoiled for you. With that established, you're watching Rail Deal Games, and I hope you like this Rail Deal review. Let's dive right in. The 80s have an overinflated reputation of being the hardest games ever made, but as I've begun to play more of them over the years, I've found that to not actually be true. Yes, there are some especially difficult games from that era, like Castlevania, Ninja Gaiden, and Ghost and Goblins. However, I find most games from that decade to actually not be that bad. Metal Gear took me 4 hours, 28 minutes, and 18 seconds to roll credits on, and over the course of my playthrough I would kill 477 humans, set off the alarm 160 times and die 88 times. Depending on how difficulty is defined, this means that the entirety of the original Metal Gear is easier than the Margit boss fight from Elden Ring. The gameplay in Metal Gear is pretty simple, much like most games of that era. It's self-built as a tactical espionage game, and as far as prototypal stealth games go, it does a good job of meeting the genre definition. The core loop of the game is this. Snake will travel around Outer Haven, periodically getting hints via Big Boss on his codex, sneak or kill enemies in each room, get keys and items, and kill bosses. The stealth mechanics in this game actually surprised me at several points. At the beginning of the game, Snake begins with binoculars, and this item comes in handy quite often. The item allows Snake to see one tile in any direction as long as he's not in a confined space. This is great because sometimes enemies are set up to be looking directly at one entrance to a room, meaning if the player sends Snake into that room via that guarded path, an alarm will trigger the the instant the room loads. Considering how clunky action combat is in this game, this is never an ideal situation. The binoculars allow the player to see the initial sight lines of the enemies too, which comes in handy because of the way enemy line of sight works. An enemy's LOS is simple. They can see in a straight line, no muss, no fuss. Being slightly off center puts Snake just outside their LOS, and it's the best way to avoid detection by enemies. Beyond this, guns make noise. This is an issue since being detected is a serious 
strain on Snake's resources. I found the silencer fairly early on, which makes the handgun the best way of dispatching the more annoyingly placed guards easily. Before the silencer, the player has to sneak up behind an enemy or just outside their LOS to punch them three times. Sometimes enemies will drop ammo or rations. Much to my surprise, there were a few times in Metal Gear's runtime where the player's goals shift drastically, with the most iconic example of this happening right after freeing Gray Fox. Snake is captured and put in a cell right next to Gray Fox, and upon breaking down a wall between them, getting some information from Gray Fox and skedaddling right on out of there, Snake is given a new goal in his infiltration of Outer Haven. He's got to save the doctor who made Metal Gear itself, Dr. Madner. For the next 10 or 15 minutes, I kept getting spotted the instant I entered a room with guards, and I didn't understand why. After burning through loads of resources, I noticed something in my inventory that wasn't there before. A little red dot looking thing that ended up being a tracking device. Getting rid of it is as simple as pressing the activate button on it while in the inventory screen, but I really like how Kojima implemented this mechanic. It never comes up before or after this moment, but it fits the espionage theme of the game wonderfully. The fact the game never mentions it is cool too because it puts the responsibility of solving the puzzle as to why alarms keep triggering on the player. I like these types of mechanics in games and it felt refreshing to see something like this in a game after going so long without player-centric game design like this. The game does a good job at teaching gameplay mechanics too. In that previous anecdote with Gray Fox, the player is introduced to the knocking mechanic, where by punching, the player can find out if a wall is hollow or not. Hollow walls can be exploded open with C4, exposing new areas to explore or items. I reached this point in the game where I couldn't figure out what to do, and after ending my session for that night, a thought came to me. I was reminded of when I was a kid playing Wolfenstein 3D, where I would go through whole levels hitting the interact key on every wall until I found a secret. Could this be what Metal Gear wanted me to do? I thought to myself, and sure enough, that was the solution. Embodying the spirit of Kyle's, I began to punch every wall in the basement, until I discovered three separate items, two of which are necessary for progression. The way these gameplay aspects all work together is genius 80s game design, and a lot of these tropes would be things that would see a comeback in Metal Gear Solid, such as the cardboard box. This item is great for getting past cameras, but other than that, I didn't really use it that much. Those are the stealth aspects of the game, but what about when the bullets start flying? It is in these sections of the game where Metal Gear is a little weaker, albeit in a perfectly serviceable way. The isometric 8-bit nature of the gameplay makes maneuverability difficult in firefights, but there was really only one time where I found fighting enemies difficult. There's this section on a roof that's full of these flying soldier guys. Running past them isn't hard, but there is a section where the player has to fight them on a small path connected to this electrified section of ground. The machine gun seems to be the best at dealing with them, but this part of the game was definitely the hardest, and it's not like the player can just skip doing this either. The room past the electrified floor has the minesweeper, which is an item of utmost importance for the section immediately following the Hind D boss fight. And speaking of bosses, Metal Gear hosts a fair number of them, although I wouldn't say they are that impressive or difficult by and large. Every single boss has a cheesable strat, making every single one of them, including Metal Gear and Big Boss, kind of a joke. That being said, I really like the tank boss. The use of the mines here made the fight more fun in my mind, and when I did the boss survival mode, I was happy to have the chance to fight it again. There's another boss fight near the end of the game where the boss is surrounded by hostages. Killing the middle hostage will deny the player a crucial hint as to how to destroy Metal Gear. So what I did is I walked around the hole in the middle of the room, shoved my pistol into his sprite work, and fired enough bullets to delete him from existence. I also found the RC missiles to be particularly busted for boss fights. All in all, the gameplay in Metal Gear is top tier for an 80s game, and I would say it holds up pretty well with modern gaming standards. Dying wasn't too punishing, if at all. I even discovered accidentally that dying multiple times in a row will cause the game to refill Snake's ammo coffers and rations. I definitely abused my knowledge of this towards the later parts of the game, but in a game like this, gameplay is only one half of the equation. What about exploration? Is it good?
Exploration is what made me love Metal Gear. I played this game completely guideless as I do every time I play a game for the first time. And I was able to 100% complete the title on the original difficulty. I also played this game like it was 1987 too, with my notepad at the ready to write down all important information every NPC shared with me. And that's what made the experience more enjoyable and easier too. I wrote everything down and I could see how someone blasting through the game would get confused at times. Metal Gear is the type of game where the player is rewarded for exploring every room they come across. There's a star mechanic where Snake's max health and ammo ration capacity is determined by the number of stars the player has. These stars are earned by finding prisoners and freeing them, and the player can get a total of 4 stars by the end of the game. Fairly often, these prisoners will share a hint at the location of an important item or the critical path towards progression, and I found these hints extremely useful. Without these, Metal Gear would be one of those 80s games where it is impossible to figure out bereft of guides, but that sort of thing is the sign of a bad 80s game. Kojima didn't make a bad game with Metal Gear. In fact, his first game is one of, if not the most, modern feeling 80s games I've played. As such, I found every item and prisoner in the game just by checking every floor in every room after each time I found a new keycard. And Kojima makes it roughly clear where the player is supposed to go at all times. A lot of times I think people find 80s games, like Contra for example, hard because they're not willing to slow down and think while they're playing. Metal Gear and Contra share one thing in common beyond the fact that they are soldier games, and that is how each game really isn't that hard when the player slows down. As I said at the beginning of this section, I played Metal Gear completely guideless, and doing so reconfirmed how important it is to play games guideless for me. I would have found the game tedious if I was following a walkthrough the whole time while playing, and I know this is for sure how I would have felt because I've completed loads of games over the years, and the collective guide part of every completion process is super super annoying. Games are made to be figured out, for the player to be immersed in, and Metal Gear's level design is easier to figure out when the player takes the time and expends the effort to immerse themselves in the game world. Guideless, it only took four and a half hours to find everything in the game. That's not long and is shorter than some whole indie games. Rushing through the game ruins the experience, so I would recommend playing the game as it was intended to be back in 1987. There were a couple times in the exploration of this game that makes this game really stand out among the other games from the 80s and in the modern gaming landscape. Most importantly, the level design of Outer Haven is literally perfect. There's not a single thing I would change about the design of the multiple bases because, yeah, there's two primary bases in this game with a third final boss type base near the end of the game. The first base is designed the way it is to ease the player into the gameplay systems in Metal Gear. And by the end of this section, had the player played the game as intended, they'll be completely ready to explore base 2. Base 2 is essentially a more complex version of base 1, and the best way to explain why this is, is with the way the elevators work in this game. Elevators are safe points, and in base 1 the elevator can go to any floor. However, in base 2 there's one elevator that goes up and one that goes down, and these two elevators are on opposite sides of the base. This forces the player to more or less memorize the base as they plan their routes from one end to the other. And in that way it reminds me a lot of the design of Capcom's Resident Evil games. The other thing that stood out to me through my playthrough of this game are the codex calls. Throughout base 1 and 2, Big Boss is the player's primary guiding force through the base, explaining what to do next and giving hints on how to deal with certain aspects of Outer Haven's design. In Base 2, Snake gets less calls from Big Boss over the course of Base 2, with Jennifer gradually taking his place. When the player gets to Base 3, the goodwill Big Boss gained with the player comes into play. The player has been conditioned to believe Big Boss without question, which is exactly how his betrayal was so effective at tricking me. Entering the zone outside of Base 3, Snake is being shot on all sides from all angles. Big Boss tells him to enter the truck on the right, which is a trap. Entering that truck takes the player back to the beginning of base 1, and it's a long trek back to the beginning of base 3. But this means Big Boss still gives useful clues since everything he says is the opposite of what the player should do. Having been tricked once, I used Big Boss's hints to guide me through base 3 until I was at the foot of Metal Gear itself. Metal Gear is what the game is named after, and Metal Gear is also where the importance of the game's themes lie. August 6th, 1945 is 79 years ago. Realistically, that's not too long ago, and that date is extremely important because that day changed the world. That's the day Hiroshima was destroyed by the first ever use of atomic bombs in warfare. Something that happened 79 years ago is easy to forget. It's easy to forget how horrific the power of the atom is, 
and the nuclear age that created the world we live in started on that day. Naturally, atomic warfare has historically been the focus of Japanese media over the years, with the first example I can think of being Godzilla in 1954. The original Gojira is a horror movie, not because of Godzilla himself, but because of the implications of the long-term effects of the two atomic bombs. Released nine years after the bombs, and released the same year as the Lucky Dragon No. 5 fishing vessels being polluted by the Bikini Atoll nuclear tests, Gojira was chirotic, matching the fears and sensibilities of the time period. As such, the Japanese understand the dangers of the atom far better than anyone else ever could, and their media reflects that. In 1983, Barefoot Gin released, a movie made by a Hiroshima bomb survivor about his first-hand account of what destruction looks like in the shadow of an atomic cloud. This is what an atomic bomb looks and sounds like from the eyes and ears of people on the ground. Back then, the bomb had to be carried by a B-29, something that could be shot down and seen coming from miles away. But what if the launcher for an atomic bomb was mobile, tanky, and ground level? That's what Metal Gear is, and why it would be a horrible weapon in real life. Part of what makes atom bombs less useful in the modern day is the nature of countermeasures against them now, and the global economic damage using one could cause. But Metal Gear is a mobile nuclear mech. It would absolutely change warfare the way we know it. The nature of nuclear suffering has been covered many times over the past 79 years, and understanding that suffering is the only way to truly understand the high-stakes nature of Metal Gear's story. In Hiroshima, John Hersey writes, Mr. Tanimoto met hundreds and hundreds who were fleeing, and every one of them seemed to be hurt in some way. The eyebrows of some were burned off, and skin hung from their faces and hands. Others, because of pain, held their arms up as if carrying something in both hands. Some were vomiting as they walked. Many were naked or in shreds of clothing. On some undressed bodies, the burns made patterns of undershirt straps and suspenders. And on the skin of some women, since white repelled the heat from the bomb and dark clothes absorbed it and conducted it to the skin, the shape of flowers they had had on their kimonos. Almost all had their heads bowed, looked straight ahead, 
were silent and showed no expression whatsoever. Mr. Tanimoto reached down and took the woman by the hands, but her skin slipped off in huge, glove-like pieces. Atomic attacks in the modern age would be devastating, and one aspect of them people don't consider, beyond the bomb itself and the radiation, is the conflagration it causes. Fire would spread rampantly, and many people would burn to death despite surviving the bomb blast itself. Whenever rain falls during one of these firestorms, it creates miniature vortexes, tiny tornadoes for a lack of a better term, that rip through places causing more destruction. It's not the destruction of a Category 5 tornado, of course, but these tiny vortexes are just the icing on this apocalyptic cake. I guess you might be fine if you were Sutomu Yamaguchi, but that's because he's one of the few people to survive both the bomb of Hiroshima and the bomb of Nagasaki. And to put this further into perspective, Hersey writes about how survivors would eat pumpkins cooked in the flash heat right off the vine and pull fully baked potatoes from beneath the dirt. I recommend you read Hiroshima sometime. I use these quotes because they happen early on in the book and they don't represent the true depths of suffering the people of Hiroshima went through. Think of it this way, if the real suffering and body horror of the atomic bomb is a gunshot, what I just shared with you is a paper cut in comparison. Kojima used his knowledge of game design and what would likely be a personal knowledge of how atomic bombs impact a world to craft a game and story that may appear simple on the surface, but matter much, much more when historical context is considered. Is Metal Gear worth playing now? If it weren't clear from the way I had nothing bad to say about my time with the game, yes, Metal Gear is one 80s game I think all historical gamers should play in their life. It is definitely one of the best 80s games I've ever played by far, and I'm excited to play through the rest of the franchise whenever I can find the time to do so. Between its gameplay, level design, exploration feel, and story predicated upon the atomic threat, Metal Gear truly stands out as a fantastic piece of media and proves Kojima has never made a bad game in his entire life. For those of you new to my reviews, my final statement on every game I review is whether or not it will make my top 100 list for the decade of its original release. Metal Gear will, and it might even be in my top 10 for the decade. Games go into my top 100 lists either marked as red or blue, with red meaning that they are there to stay and blue meaning they're first in line to be knocked off. Obviously Metal Gear will be going in the red category, joining the highest echelon of 80s gaming alongside the absolute greats like Super Mario Bros, Final Fantasy, and Tetris. And that's the video guys. What do you think of Metal Gear and Kojima's work? If you'd all like to see a review of Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake for me, I'd love to give the game a try sometime. Let me know in the comments section below and while you're there, consider smashing that like button, subscribing, and dinging that notification bell for more rail deal gaming content like this in the future. Regardless of what you choose to do, have an awesome day gamers.